by 121. This is Colonial Mismanagement and Cosmopolitan Queens, Roman North Africa. All right, so why are we looking at Rome? <laughs> After all of this uh, talk about how Rome and Greece are not the center of the world, well, because we're not looking really at Rome. We're looking at Rome's relationship with peoples on its frontiers. And North Africa is a pretty interesting frontier, all things considered, so it provides us with some interesting material, uh, a way to observe just how bad Rome actually could be at handling uh, what it was actually going to do once the military operations were over. It is one thing to be a conquering power, it's another to be an imperial or a colonial power. There are so many cultural differences between Rome and many of the areas that it conquered. How do you bring them into the empire? Can you even do that with some of them? This is not an art that Rome simply knew. There were serious false starts and some real miscalculations on their part. I would say a lot of it happened because there was a question about how much effort they actually wanted to expend. Now, how much are these frontier zones worth? And how high should they be on the priority list of where military resources were spent? So our first example, as I said, is North Africa. Uh, it is one of the less known but more problematic frontiers that Rome faced. All right, well, we can't talk about North Africa without giving just a little bit of background on the Punic Wars. I'm not going to assume that everybody listening to this uh, in the class actually knows uh, the full background, and I'm certainly not going to take too much time to talk about them, but to give you a sketch of the basic outline of these conflicts is essential, I think, in this case. So Carthage uh, basically allowed itself to be talked into intervening in a battle between Syracuse and another Sicilian city, and Rome had to step in for fear of allowing Carthage to gain a foothold in Sicily. You don't want anybody who's not you gaining a foothold in Sicily. Uh, that is an awfully strategic location that would allow you to control trade in much of the Mediterranean. This sort of conflict between cities is a useful pretext for Roman intervention. Uh, Syracuse actually uh, decides to throw in with Rome, and this leads Rome to try and push the Carthaginians back into their traditional zone of influence. So there are three Punic Wars. The first is mostly naval. It starts in 264 BCE. Rome tries and fails to invade Carthage. And the fighting is intermittent until Rome finally manages to build a proper fleet and invade Sicily. And when I say finally, I, I do want to stress the fact that they tried and failed a number of times. Again, shipbuilding isn't something you can just learn how to do. But one of the things about the Romans is that they were persistent. So the war ends in 241, with Rome controlling most of Sicily as a new province. Hamilcar Barca, who was the Carthaginian general on the island, sued for peace. And he was told that he had to hand over his arms and leave Sicily. We are told that his response was perhaps a little dramatic. He said, even though my country submits, I would rather perish on the spot than go back home under such disgraceful conditions. Now, at this point, things between Rome and Carthage had not gotten so bad that this was feasible. This is, this, this is not how you settle something. You don't have the opposing general murdered. So Rome was a little bit more lenient as a result. The two states were to officially be friends again. Carthage did have to evacuate Sicily and uh, return all prisoners, pay reparations for 10 years. Now, between the First and the Second War, Rome expanded their influence in Italy, uh, pushing further north. They also took uh, Corsica and Sardinia, so two more islands, which made the situation with Carthage even more tense. Uh, the Second Punic War started in 219, when Roman and Carthaginian spheres of influence in Spain clashed. This is all about colonies. There were new Carthaginian colonies there. Uh, the most important of them was Cartagena, New Carthage. Uh, the reason for having them there was to take advantage of silver deposits. Uh, Hamilcar also saw Spain as a source of new military recruits. Um, supplies of precious metal were important, but you know, not secondary, just 
two valuable reasons to be in Spain, basically. Um, and so he was the one that initiated this colonization project because he had to find a way to rebuild his state's reserve and to pay for the indemnity, uh, those reparations that I mentioned. But over time, this expansion was very worrisome for Rome. Uh, after all, you know, you, you don't want Carthage getting too close to your colonies on the northeast coast. They did try and settle it via treaty, but Carthage broke this. Not intentionally. Uh, it's very complex. It had to do with interfering with towns belonging uh, to the other. So often this is the case with broken treaties in the pre-modern world. I sometimes think that they worked in overly complex things like this just to have an excuse to say, oh, you broke the treaty. Um, we're going to do what we want to do now. So by the time the Second War breaks out, the person in charge is Hannibal, um, famous, famously uh, the son of Hamilcar Barca, uh, who is possibly angry at the Romans for shaming his father. He didn't want to destroy Rome. He just wanted to cut Rome to, down to size to stop it from intervening elsewhere. Uh, he lost a lot of troops in his march across the Alps, but won a couple of major victories, including the Battle of Cannae in 216 CE. This is a major defeat for Rome, but Rome was campaigning in Spain with great success. They were dismantling the Carthaginian colonies there and keeping Hannibal's brother from sending him any troops. Uh, the chief Roman general, Scipio, defeated the Carthaginians in Spain, won over their allies by not treating them like Rome usually treated defeated enemies. He basically used Spain as a training ground for himself and his troops. Meanwhile, Hannibal spends almost a decade in Italy, but then has to go home because there is a Roman army at the walls of Carthage. It is a Roman army led by Scipio. This ends with the Battle of Zama, and afterwards Scipio is called Scipio Africanus because he wins a great battle in Africa. Carthage has its back to the wall at this point. The indemnity that's levied is higher, but what worries Rome between the Second and the Third War is that Carthage is trying very hard to pay it off as quickly as possible. So what they did is they sent a senatorial commission. They found that Carthage was enjoying an economic boom. They had a newly successful trade network based on its agricultural products. Now Cato, a famous uh, Roman orator, argued that Carthage was becoming a threat again. So he ended all of his speeches with, in addition, it is my opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. He must have been a terrible dinner guest. You know, pa pass the salt, uh, Cato. Oh, here you go. Also, it is my opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. The whole thing, though, is a little strange because Carthage had been a fairly loyal ally to Rome for 50 years. Possibly this is seen as a way to make a profit, or perhaps as a sign of a psychological shift in how Rome thought it should deal with threats. You know, think about the fact that there had already been two wars with Carthage and how costly they had been for Rome, even if Rome was terminally stubborn and kept at it no matter what. So you might define this as preemptive self-defense, but either way, the Third War was likely inevitable. Carthage made the mistake of fighting some of its Numidian neighbors without checking with Rome first, again violating the peace treaty, and they lost, which made things worse. This gives the Roman Senate a casus belli, a case for war. And in one of the sources of the time, we're told that Carthage begs to know what they have to do to win a pardon. And the response from Rome is, you must make things right with the Roman people. And when they're asked, well, what do we do? The response is, you know perfectly well what is necessary. They don't want to see things made right. They want the excuse to invade, which they do in 149. And when Carthage asks for terms, the Senate says, hand over the city and go settle elsewhere, at least nine miles from the sea. They can't do this, obviously, so they decide to fight. It leads to the destruction of the city in 146 by another Scipio, the uh, adopted grandson of Africanus. Rome had no real justification for the Third Punic War. They had behaved rather badly, and a number of writers of the time recognized this. The Punic Wars are significant because they do result in the end of a great power. Rome moved in and took over many of Carthage's former colonies, uh, filling the void. Now, the problem is, did they actually want to do that? Questionable. Were they at all prepared to replace Carthage in North Africa, 
Uh, not in the slightest. At this point, Rome was not at all equipped to run an empire. Uh, in a similar situation to what we see in other areas like Spain and Macedonia, the senators set out to govern had absolute authority and no bureaucracy to keep them under control. So they are basically exposed to all the temptations of absolute power and no limits. Sometimes their behavior became exceptionally bad. So they would ring the province for all it was worth, they would embezzle money, they would mistreat the people, etc., etc. The real issue, of course, is that they leave the neighboring kingdoms to themselves as well. They obviously didn't have the resources or the desire or the mandate to do anything about expansion. And in North Africa in particular, that's the root of the new problem. Because African kingdoms at the time did not have working succession systems. The ideal was that the most competent male heir succeeded, but always, you know, who's the most competent? Are they going to agree on who the most competent is? So the one I want to talk about is Numidia, which uh, was a significant player in the Punic Wars. It was an ally of Carthage first and an ally of Rome later. And as we mentioned, it was the excuse for Rome's final attack in the end. They do become essentially a client kingdom of Rome. Uh, after the Second Punic War, Rome basically acknowledges their existence and their borders. They are within the Roman orbit, but they are semi-autonomous, at least on the surface. And likely the reality of that autonomy was determined by whatever Rome's needs were at any point. Now, Rome gets dragged into Numidia's succession struggles because they start taking sides in Roman affairs towards the end of the Republican period. It really didn't matter if the Numidians were just squabbling amongst themselves. Rome probably would have left them alone to do it. But when this tribal kingdom was reaching out to try and manipulate Rome, no, we're not having that. Uh, Rome is the proverbial man with a hammer that sees every problem as a nail. And in this case, it all starts with the Yergothine War. So the Numidian king, after the death of his brothers, who were his co-rulers, was faced with a threat to his power in the form of his bastard nephew, Jugurtha. Jugurtha took after his grandfather, who was a fabulously popular and famous Numidian king who had actually united the kingdom uh, during the Second Punic War. A Roman writer says the king tried to get rid of his nephew by sending him off to command the Numidian troops fighting alongside Rome in Italy. Bad call, uncle. Uh, what happens when you send an intelligent and talented young man off to fight alongside Roman troops? He learns how to fight like a Roman, and then he brings that knowledge back home again. He made all kinds of Roman friends as well. He makes himself well enough known that the king was forced to name him joint heir with his sons. And so when he dies, the king, civil war breaks out. Jugurtha killed one cousin, <laughs> defeated the other. And the other uh, actually managed to flee to Rome and appeal for support. And Jugurtha kept trying to bribe the Senate to see things his way. Rome tried to say, well, just split the damn kingdom between you, okay? But it didn't actually take steps to enforce this. And so in 112, Jugurtha sacks the city of Cerda, which had sheltered his cousin. Uh, he killed all the male inhabitants, and unfortunately a number of them were Italian settlers. So boom, now Rome's interested. The war lasts for six years, and in the end, Jugurtha's father-in-law, the king of Mauritania, had betrayed him and delivered him in chains to the Roman general Sulla. Jugurtha dies in prison back home, but at, in, back uh, in Rome, but back home he's seen as a heroic defender of Africa against Rome. The approach he took, trying to manipulate uh, the empire, is seen as a perfectly legitimate strategy. Now, in the following generation, Numidian princes start to try and manipulate the rivalry between Roman generals in particular. Causes more wars, most of the princes come to messy ends. Uh, eventually, a last surviving prince is defeated by Caesar, and Numidia is annexed. And Mauritania is as well, but only once its king, who sided with Caesar, died. So just to give you a, a quick look uh, at uh, where these uh, kingdoms are, <laughs> uh, the orange and the green are both Mauritania. They're just two different uh, administrative divisions. Yellow is Numidia. Uh, purple is uh, the proconsular con uh, province of Africa. So that gives you a sense of how close they were um, uh, to both uh, Spain and Sicily. 
All right, now, apparently Caesar thought it was more economical in general to control these territories directly. Uh, wars, as we keep talking about, are expensive, and wars at the frontier mean that you can't keep your eye on more serious conflicts close to home. Again, it's a question of prioritization. So Numidia and Mauritania's story takes a new twist in 25 BCE. <coughs> Caesar had taken the young son of the Numidian prince, General Juba, to Rome to raise there. This young man's name was also Juba. He was educated in the classical Greek way. Uh, he supposedly was quite the writer, wrote a wide range of uh, texts on history, geography, art, and medicine. We don't have any of them. They're just referred to in other sources. Uh, he was actually raised in Octavian's household. So once uh, Octavian came to the throne as Augustus, he trusted him and he sent him to Mauritania to take over as a client king. He also gave him a wife. The wife was Cleopatra Selene, who was the daughter of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. She had also been brought up in Rome after her parents' death in Octavian's household. So together, the two of them created a new Roman city at Iul Caesarea, basically built it from the ground up, and they worked on nurturing its cultural life. They imported actors, they built a library, they commissioned Greek artists to create statues. Uh, if you go there uh, today, museums in the area possess this amazing treasure trove of Greco-Roman art because Juba was such an art lover. So they are trying to Romanize their new kingdom. And unfortunately, Rome did not actually send him with sufficient military support to put down rebellions from the mountain tribes. So Rome constantly had to ride to the rescue. And what happens eventually is the third Augustan legion is permanently posted in Numidia and Mauritania and stays there for 400 years. They dealt with many revolts in the early days. Uh, the most famous, perhaps, is the only one that we really have the time to discuss. This is the revolt of Tacfarinas in 17 CE. Now, Tacfarinas is another one of these dangerous people. He is a tribesman who was trained in the military arts by Rome. He deserted and passed his knowledge on to his original followers, the Mauritanians. So he combines the Roman way of fighting with his uh, traditional ways and creates the perfect guerrilla campaign. And at this point in their history, the Romans can't really cope with this sort of uh, strategy. And Tacfarinas kept sending messages to the emperor Tiberius saying, give me my army and my army land or you'll have endless war. And we are told this by Tacitus. Tiberius tried to trick them with an amnesty, and meanwhile the Roman army is working furiously to try and learn a new way of fighting. Not all that successfully at first. Now, when Juba dies, he leaves behind uh, a son who is a minor at the mercy of his advisors. And Tacfarinas immediately called for a full-out revolt to get rid of the Romans entirely. This won him allies from all over North Africa, and it is entirely possible that they would have pushed the Romans out, but there was one Roman governor who happened to be intellectually flexible enough to pick up Tacfarinas' style of fighting, and who happened to be lucky enough to launch a surprise attack on his camp and kill him. So without the leader, the rebellion dies. Now, it's not the only revolt. There are plenty more on a regular basis, but Rome had learned from this one, and they knew they had to be mobile when fighting in Africa if they were going to succeed. But they face some seriously challenging choices. Once you take direct control, you have to keep control or you risk rebellion. Colonization is expensive in time and energy. And part of the problem is that they simply didn't put sufficient effort into the original conquest. There was a distinct failure of Romanization. If they're gonna keep a conquered people quiet and happy, you make them feel like they belong. And Romanity in Africa in this time period was a thin veneer atop a society that was still largely tribal. Now they did build roads and aqueducts and improve ports, but always for military reasons, for the ease of exporting goods. They treated Africa like a resource and a possession. You would have thought that uh, the fact that so many Roman veterans uh, stayed there and uh, intermarried with the locals after they retired would have helped things, but it didn't because 
they actually began to live with their families outside of the camps. There were people being culturally assimilated here, but it wasn't the Africans. Uh, the economic structure didn't really help with Romanization either. Uh, the Romans and the well-off Africans uh, would try to be Roman in the towns, but the majority of the population were the rural poor. poor. And they were being exploited by absentee landlords to make Africa the granary of the empire. Again, it's a resource. It's a possession. Tribal life continued. Even nomadic life continued. And once the empire's hold on the province started to weaken, tribal power makes a comeback. And I'd love to talk about that some more, but at this point we're getting into the medieval period, so I should probably leave it there. So as you can see... Um, Rome had a lot of learning to do, and they had some fumbles along the way. And uh, a lot of the things they tried did not work so well. Okay, uh, that will do it for this topic. I will be back with another shortly. Thanks very much, guys.